Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, I, I thank you so much, David, for allowing Stormwater Awareness Week to to team up with you uh, this morning. In fact, this is your normal open Friday forum. And, and what is that? Tell, I, I think we got us probably got some of your your normal crowd here, but we also have some Stormwater Awareness Week people. They may not even know that. So tell us a little about, well, first introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what this is. Well, yeah. So, you know, I've been doing the stormwater erosion control for a couple, two, three, four decades now. And, uh, but um, with Zoom and classes online, we started this every Friday, 8 a.m. for an hour or more. Uh, anybody can just come to the link and we will talk about anything erosion and stormwater. And it's great because we, we learn from biologists or hydrologists who stop in and contribute or have questions about erosion control and everybody's cross learning, you know, so it's really a good free forum. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that's going to be the flavor of today's workshop uh, for the stormwater awareness week crowd. Uh, we're going to be, um, let's see, we got somebody with some background noise yeah. or is that, or is that your heater, David? <laughs> uh, no, no, it's, it's not snowing yet here. In Minnesota. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, uh, this is going to be interactive. So we're going to want you to unmute yourself at times. Um, this is going to feel more like a radio talk show and that's, that's intentional. We're trying to do this. And I want to talk, uh, I want to brag a little bit about David. Dave is actually the guy who trained me. Uh, I, I got my credentials as a trainer of record, as a CPESC, and, and a lot. And, and I owe a lot to David, uh, even getting trained as a QSP, QSD. He's the one who trained me. In fact, uh, to be a CPESC instructor, both David and I were CPESC instructors at one time, I had to teach under him. And right. um, uh, that was... Uh, that was a great experience. I, I really enjoyed it. Thanks, John. And, um, you know, as all things come around, uh, you've uh, been uh, delivering a lot of goods to myself and the rest of the industry now for years. So it's uh, it's this mutual cycle upwards, right? Right, right. And, and there's a third uh, trio of this Three Musketeers, and that's John McCullough. And we really wanted him to be here to this morning. I, I think you would have really enjoyed him, but you got to keep him in your thoughts and prayers. He's going through some pretty significant health challenges and yeah. uh, he had to, uh, not COVID, but other health challenges and he, he had right. to drop out. And, uh, but he is uh, also one of the guys who's been on the forefront of erosion yeah. theory and implementation. Yeah. have a, a lot of respect for his work and so right. and i i learned under john uh, for years uh, and so there you go all this mentorship going on but what were you gonna say john well anyways i'm 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 looking forward to this david so let's let's start to, by talking about where are you well, <laughs> and how do you get there i'm essentially in a cabin in the woods on a lake in northern minnesota uh and I came here last summer when COVID hit and I could do Zoom online trainings. And then all of this summer since May, I've been here and I will be returning to California to pick up a few of the field jobs because it's good to keep it real and keep your feet in the ground. But I didn't uh, take on any while I was here so I could be here. So that's where I am. Mm-hmm. And by the way, there's no one who does more training than David. In fact, I'm on the industrial general permit training team, and we look at the records of who's doing what training, and David, by far, he's got maybe 80, 90 percent of the of the students that, that are going through his program. And how, I, how often do you do the QSP to QSD class? Once a week, every week, yeah. I, I don't see how you do that. Yeah, I do it quarterly, and it and my voice is trashed after yeah. that <laughs> well you know jerry pitt and i do it together so we tag team and it helps but also uh um you know we we're happy to do it for just a couple two three people and and that's hard for most uh, firms to do yeah no you guys you guys have how many people have you trained in this i guess it's been 13 years 
That's what Amy well, Cronston was saying. 13 years we've been doing this. Well, you know, it's 2010, right? So, but I, and my, my summary, I, I, I say it's maybe 15,000 total forever, you know? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get to some good material, John. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. So you, you're in Minnesota and you said you had some lessons learned by this road trip. Right. So I am uh, deeply uh, distraught because when I used to do landscaping for 15 years in the 80s into the 90s, I would go to the beautification awards and see the flowers and fountains. Right. And as soon as I did 10 years of training at all the conferences to learn about erosion control, it's like endless photos of disasters. And I keep hoping that we're going to get past that, but we're not. You know, electricians have to build the wiring system correctly or they get in trouble, but we don't get in trouble. We keep building things the wrong way, twice, get paid, and harm the environment. Worse than had we done nothing at all. <laughs> yeah. it's, really, it's really bad. So, so that's what I'm looking at. I, I took a trip here and I started taking pictures. When I left California, Nevada was snowing and cold, and I would take pictures along the way, and I'm taking pictures all summer. So, yeah. Well, you got any, any pictures to share with us? Yeah, let's see where they are. I have more. Is this the first one here? No, I got to find that way. Uh, I had it here a minute ago right there. There it is. Okay, yeah. So this is in uh, Montana or Idaho. I'm going to share it. Hold on. Get it over here. And right over there. Share screen. All right. So this is going to show us, folks, why we, I hate to say it, we don't follow the permit guidance in certain areas. Like we don't put fiber rolls at the grade break because grade breaks are never on contour unless they are, but they never are unless they are, but they're not. We only put linear barriers on contour and grade breaks and toes of slope are never on contour unless they are, but they're not. So as we see uh, right here, so this essentially was put on contour, you know, I mean, on the uh, grade break from the road to the linear barrier, there's one slope and then there's another slope to the left. So that means that this linear barrier is on a dropping transect mm -hmm. and it's not on contour. So as a result, we are funneling water along that and, and then it becomes eroding. So this is why we don't follow the permit when it says put fiber rolls on a grade break if the grade break is off contour. We keep it on the face of the slope on contour only, all right? That's our only option on contour. Well, well and the other misnomer is perimeter controls. When people hear perimeter, they naturally think perimeter. But we don't necessarily put them on perimeters, do we? No, the perimeter might be vegetated, but... Or if the perimeter is going downhill, that's definitely not a place we want it. Right. So perimeter controls can be run-on control at the top, and the draining perimeter gets the sediment control. So the run-on control at the top is a diversion, which is a different category of practice. All right. This is a, a, a fuel station going in in uh, North Dakota, and you see a stabilized entrance to the huge basin. Now that basin, you see that far slope. That's a dam. It's an embankment. It's a perched basin above a roadway very sketchy and scary to have that condition but you see all the sediment entering in and so they have not stabilized the uh, conditions up gradient so we're filling in the basin with sediments all right so that's not cool another thing here you see the silt fence is going up and down like john just mentioned you got your unnecessary silt fence have the courage to say no nothing goes there except consideration for run on but here the drainage is going away from us so this is where we would want water to enter that green field and if you have a low compost sock and a little smiley face a smiley face coming up like this the concept of segmentation is very important so if this flow is going this way through a low profile actually porous filtering compost sock instead of the two foot high dam then the water gets to enter this green field, and that's what we want. We want to get the water off our site many times. That is the strategy in small segments here and there. So a little return here means the water is catched and discharged, and that's a good thing. But as they were doing it, 
they have. And of course, the, you know, the entry level instru- inspector will see that problem, you know, and, and call that on a report. But we want to recognize that the actual selection and location and design of these BMPs is often flawed, more than just the disrepair. And as a result, we see that this discharge, this disturbed slope is being diverted down the gradient in the distance, and that's unacceptable. We should be having a low profile with a return incrementally so that water is caught and released to the green field off to the left instead of being diverted into the distance. So we have yeah. to be flow managers. Looks like McDonald's is going to get a sediment load. Yeah. <laughs> special sauce. So there you see is the outlet uh, overflow pipe in the distance. And, and uh, so this is going to be perched water above a roadway. Now, of course, the actual fueling station has the kitty litter for spills. But what's the other half of the practice? Clean up the kitty litter, right? Not just throw the kitty litter. I saw a job once where I was inspecting an industrial site and the landscape crew came along and put all that kitty litter into the air. They blew it with a blower to clean it up and it disappeared. So that was effective. Yeah, so we got to get the, uh, the, you know, stopping short is another concept to make a note of, you know, a good idea, kitty litter, but stopping short didn't sweep it up. Well, then go back to that basin. Uh, that is such a classic, um, you, you know, that's classic design. And, and I, you know, I imagine where this, this project's at, they got to handle a lot of water, but there's a lot of things wrong with that basin. Mm-hmm. Um, no vegetation. Uh, and and really, there could be doing more to to allow infiltration, allow uptake through uh, evapotranspiration. Uh, so many times, you know, the engineers see basin, and that's what you're going to get. But that's really not good stormwater management. Yeah, it's uh, exposed, and we'll see some uh, scary stuff in a few photos here. There it is. So the embankment uh, is up in the distance there, holding back that perched water. And that's pretty scary to me. I'm not a geotech, but uh, I'll show you a slide up ahead that makes me worry. So we've got this unstabilized concentrated flow, and that is always our biggest nightmare is the concentrated flow. And here it is unstabilized. To the right of this photo is this view here. So that's a flatter area and there's more sedimentation and ponding happening there. It's less conveyance and more sedimentation. So if we have a, in the, around that exit point, that drain, that culvert, uh, you can see all the sediment that's there and you can see they've raised up with rebar a, uh, uh, retention well there's a lack of maintenance if this is the design because now water is going right over the proud raised uh, settling area and it's not a settling area anymore so it's a lack of maintenance of course but, that pipe's going to be the next thing to fill up with yeah. sediment yes and on the other side you'll see it's discharging sediment everywhere but i want to make a note too that we we generally want to not believe in check dams check dams can be okay, properly designed and utilized, and properly sized rock check dams for a permanent installation can be fine. But in a temporary condition, check dams are normally not helping us. And certainly, if you can use a fiber roll check dam, it should be tied down, not vampire stake through the heart. Mm-hmm. All right. And you can see it's blown out. It's not okay. And there, they're all blown out. So we have to have the finished condition time and time again. And I ask folks to make a note. What is the finished condition and what's stopping us from getting there? Is there any more construction improvement that must occur? If the answer is no, then a proper vegetation plan, the final phase should be implemented yesterday. But they didn't do that. They focused on other things. Silt fence never belongs on the face of a slope, a two foot high dam. What if there was no swale there and we had like on some jobs I've seen, two foot high dam, two foot high dam, and then it fails at one point and catastrophically you have a mountain of water running in the road and killing the people. So this is very scary stuff when we become water managers. Well, and the, and the other thing you're doing is even if it doesn't give way, you're saturating that slope. And so you're setting up for slope failure. John, you nailed it because the slides up ahead are gonna show actual failure of the slope profile. Um, and so you can see there's a hydraulic jump. If you successfully have a check dam that's working and having sediment on the backside, well, the check dam 
now it creates a hydraulic jump and starts down cutting immediately. So all the sediment below that check dam is going to be caught at the next check dam if it doesn't fail. And you have another hydraulic jump. So these are spaced incorrectly. They're, they're not helping. They're hurting. And you have to believe they're hurting you. Now, if we have all this pond water at, uh, going through a pipe to a, a rock slide, and then we say to the water, uh, now you're entering an unlined ditch, have at it. After all that protection and effort, we release the water and you can see it's down cutting to the sea horizon, the rock horizon, whatever. And it's, it's not a good transition. We have to always ask the question, how will I let the water go and will it be safe? We just let it go into the ditch here and it's not safe. It's erosive. And you can see right there to the right of the rocks, the beginning of slumping, sliding. There it is, John. You called it a water weeping through that dam. And I'm worried that could be a catastrophic uh, safety hazard. Yeah. Because they're ponding water. And if you read the book that nobody reads, you know, the BMP manual, it says about fiber rolls, not always appropriate for slump prone soils. And like silty soils, clay, uh, sandy soils are prone to sliding. Gravelly, silty, sandy. They're not real cohesive. And, and you know, I love that picture. That's a great picture of weeping. Um, a lot of people don't understand that form of erosion. Uh, that erosion actually works its way back from the front of the picture to the um to to the rear it's actually working up slope two yeah. two forces are causing that one is saturated soils underneath going into the slope so if you have hydraulic pressure which that silt fence is is creating it's creating hydraulic pressure and saturated soils that is going to cause that weeping then look at the front of the picture, you have a path going left to right. Anytime you put a flow perpendicular to another flow, what do you do? You, you, it, physics says you draw a vacuum. And so when you're running a flow perpendicular to another flow, you got a vacuum being applied. In fact, mm -hmm. we're going to talk a little bit about why I've spent time in national parks, but a lot of the um, side canyons in the Grand Canyon were formed exactly like this picture. So down cutting in the foreground and then saturated soil uh, under gravity forces and hydraulic forces are pushing it out. Uh, so you can see more of the same here. So we do want the final stabilization should be probably a heavy duty coconut, uh, uh, no plastic, uh, and a properly graded, remember blankets are only meant uh, with rare exceptions for uniform engineered conditions that are very well prepared and smooth. And uh, then you would seed it and make sure there's a seed bed there. And then you staple it. Now, what happens a lot of times is they don't staple and have cross checks in a properly installed blanket. So water will get underneath. We'll see that up ahead. And you can see the the, the water is always trying to resolve its total volume with a cross-sectional area and the velocity that's allowed by the slope. So it's always trying to find that balance. Oh, and is that the basin right there? That's the basin. So you can oh. see that perch condition. And you got you got erosion cutting from uh, cutting into your levee. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's that's a disaster waiting to happen. It's pretty sketchy looking. So you would think somebody would be concerned, but you see at the top of that embankment, they're working on landscaping. I don't think so. Not the time. Let's let's stabilize that dangerous condition. And did they charge a mission for you to, to uh, be able to take advantage of all this uh, phenomenal erosion features? Yeah, yeah it's public a road, so I'm just walking around. <laughs> Yeah, so there's the other side of the road, same problem. And the check dams don't work, okay. And then all, this is all the dirt ending up in the road below, public hazard, and there's the other side of the ditch. Uh, this, the, actually, all this dirt ended up on the, by the Department of Transportation's right of way, about 5,000 feet away, and the dust, okay. Yeah, and then they had one hydro seeding machine there, a dinky little machine, right? Um, but they gotta be doing blankets uh, after the hydro seeding, more or less. Now, this is a pretty flat conveyance. So it's not really an erosive location. This is a sedimentation because it's pretty wide and pretty flat. So you don't, you know, there shouldn't be sediment allowed in there, but it's not a steep ditch. 
Uh, but we don't put silt fans in front of culverts. And that's another angle on that. Now, so John, I'm transitioning to another project in Minnesota now, I'm driving along. And for miles and miles, this one city had concrete work and saw cutting going. And you know, Minnesota has 15,000 lakes. It's not 10,000, it's 15,000. It's 10,000 taxes, but 15,000 lakes. <laughs> and um, so look at the concrete work, look at the saw cutting. Now, the BMP manual, says to be vacuuming this up. And, and I would like to add that beyond vacuuming, we ought to demand that there is a fresh water application to rinse the residue and then vacuum that up. This should be a clean saw cut with no, this, in my view, this is a breach, leak, malfunction, or spill that triggers non-visible sampling in California. But, but does the Minnesota BMP manual require that? No, <laughs> uh, but, but you know, as far as sampling, it doesn't, but does it, it require uh, vacuuming? You know, that's a question that I'd say probably, hopefully. And look at miles and miles of this mess, never cleaned up, going to the creeks and lakes, miles. Wow. And remember, high pH has a serious impact on aquatic life, a direct hit. As soon as the, the aquatic life and the lake right there, because everywhere you drive in Minnesota, it's swamps and ponds and lakes and rivers and creeks and powder. So I called the city and they said, well, you know, there should be sediment controls over on the drain inlets. I said, it's not for pH. And she said, yeah, you're right. Sediment controls are not for pH. And there they are just making a mess and in my precious state, my home state. Stockpiles not covered. Saw cutting. So you got two guys watching, one guy making a mess and nobody vacuuming up. Miles and miles, miles and miles. So when I got to Minnesota, the grass, the, the corn was that high. It was two inches high. And right now it's out there seven feet high. All right. Oh, look at there. Oh, what a cabin. All right. This is another Is that your cabin? That's where I am at. Yeah. <laughs> It's pretty nice, um, but I got to leave pretty soon too. It, it looks uh, like you're you're stocked for wood. Oh, it's like five years of wood. You know, we've got on the side here. Yeah. So the thing is, this this is another housing project, and, and check it out. This is a big deal. This is the paved, finished part of the project that I'm standing on, but the final lift of asphalt is not here, and so the vehicles go in and out through those two <clears throat> markers there. In the middle of the road on the road crown but what this means is all the run on from behind me never gets into the curb the concrete curb because the final lift is not there so when we manage run on we should have some gravel bags right here intercepting where nobody drives all this road crown and dumping it into here where it can go straight down the storm drain in a clean run-on diversion condition. It's a big deal. And they're not even thinking about it. They're accepting all this run-on that's clean to enter their muddy site. It's mm -hmm. not good. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. not good. And then the trucks could be up here, you know, on the road crown going through and uh, not impeding that water on the sides. But then again, there's a trail that's going to be finished and the trail in the distance there is another source of run on that could be diverted before it gets down to the work area. So we always start as erosion control professionals with what's headed my way, the top of the project. And yeah. there you go, spills and so forth. And we says, have a comment from uh, Mel, uh, David. He says in his experience, run on is the most overlooked BMP here in California. Absolutely. We talk about it in every class. Everybody has their disaster stories from the last job. Yeah, and you know, what I've noticed too, it's the small things that either make the difference or cause the problems. Uh, so just a little thing, like you said, just putting some gravel bags or sandbags in the right location can make all the difference in the world. Yeah, and you're right, John, that is a location for a sandbag, not a gravel bag. Uh, sandbags are as diversions, not near drainage points, and there would be little chance of them getting driven over there, and they'd be highly effective in diverting that water into the curb. And you know that rusting drain inlet says uh, no dumping drains to creek, you know. 
<laughs> now, I want to point out that a lot of times these uh, future driveway entrances, when you have the uh, over excavated back of curb, like at that drain inlet, it's a typically over excavated condition, which is a miniature pond maker. If you would uh, put your, again, maybe gravel bags or right here, and then when right. in the low spot, and then all this water, which is basically a flat little pond, would move towards the low spot and be forced to bleed through the gravel bags that are well designed and porous filters, and then enter the clean street down the drain inlet. So there is a simple, cheap way to do this. And I didn't even mention cover. Uh, the cover would help, help a lot too, but the sediment control here is ill understood. Everybody wants to throw a bag in the drain inlet and say, we'll catch it here. No. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I always say that drain inlet protection is too little, too late. Yeah, it might be the first thing we do, but it's the last thing we believe in. And so again, the question, when do we and how do we release the flow? So if water spills out of this drain and hits the rock, maybe it's entering in there, I'm not sure. There might be a cut down below, but you can see no erosion control and uh, then the concentrated flow in the ditch there. So not a good scene. Uh, they, now they have this crimped straw in the Midwest. They use a crimped straw where the tractor pulls some discs and pushes blades of straw into the ground. And then the straw in between the crimped rows is uh, loose. And so it can blow away still and wash away in the concentrated flow. So that is a concentrated flow a roadside ditch that's eroding. And you can see the arrow in the street. That is the exit lane that they installed. Now, I believe the only reason that they made this disturbance was to build that entrance to the project. And so we as managers would ask a question, is this improvement, are all improvements done? And if they are, we have to move on to the final stabilization. But time and time again, the developer just relies on the temporary ill-conceived BMPs that cost money. So here they put in uh, bogus check dams and cramped straw in a concentrated flow. It looks like this rock outfall is not even heavily activated because it has all this depositional uh, material there. The real flow is along the road edge right. and it's going straight to the creek. A hundred percent of all this straw and silt and even those check dams are ending up in the creek. Tons, that creek goes a thousand feet to the Mississippi River and tons of dirt left never to be retrieved because a non-qualified person is running this job. EPA wants a qualified person and a qualified person would not do what happened here. When I called the city and the state and said, they're not getting it right, the operator came back and put, we'll see, they, they did the wrong thing. They paid to do the wrong thing after doing this wrong thing. Concentrated flow, loose straw. Silt fence should not be perched above a creek where concentrated flow comes to silt fence. It failed every storm and tons of dirt washed away. And because I pointed out the first time, they went and dug it out and threw it behind the silt fence where it failed the next time. Well, that's why the Mississippi's brown. In my yeah. QSP, QSD class, when we're talking about stream theory, I talk about, uh, you know, the dynamic equilibrium and yeah. that the Mississippi being a giant QW moves a lot of Q's, uh, QS, right? Sediment load, under uh, 1.37 million tons per day. So and it this, changes, its, changes its course so much that one fellow figured out years ago that there was a, a, a lost a ship that had some gold in it and that the channel used to be like, 1500 feet into a uh, farmer's field and they, they went and they made an agreement and they went and they found it. Oh, well, your site's helping keep, uh, keep those stats up. Right, keep the stats up. So they're driving through the creek here and there's, you can see the crimp straw. I can see the little wind rose pushed into the ground. In the distance, there's a big old stockpile of pretty sandy material. And so, you know, we don't want to put silt fence into a creek and that's what they ha have here. We don't let the site erode and try and catch it in the creek. It's just unacceptable. Now, we David, let me ask you about that crimp straw. We don't see it much here in California, but man, when we were both CPES constructors, they talked a lot about crimp straw. Right. right. Uh, well, what yeah, do you it, think it, of it? 
it's okay when you have a good seed in the application and then a good rate of straw. And if some wind comes up, uh, you know, the wind rows of crimp straw do help it from moving, but not in a concentrated flow. But in a sheet flow condition, raindrop condition, uh, those seeds are designed to sprout quickly. So not much wind and rain should be happening by the time that the seed comes up. So it's a temporary short-term cover that's anchored by six inch apart rows, can be workable, unless you're in a super high windy spot, you know? Mm -hmm. And just a reminder to everyone who's joining us, don't, don't be shy. If you wanna unmute yourself and, uh, and give us a comment or your, your suggestion, or if you, you want to put in chat, we'd love, we wanna talk to you. You could cut cut David off anytime you want. Anytime you want, but I have a few more slides. I'll be done. Uh, so there's the sand stockpile, sandy soil stockpile in the distance, and to the left is the water body creek. And fortunately, they had the silt fence. Now that tote should have been removed. It's got some chemical in it. Uh, but there's the look at the silt against the silt fence protecting the creek. It did a job, you know, but it shouldn't have to work. Uh, Oh, I thought I put that other photo in here, but that sand stockpile pretty much melted towards the creek and in, in catastrophic ways. And so the silt fence helped, but we shouldn't be allowing that stockpile to fail like that, right? There's the, but what they did here is they wanted to get their equipment into the dirt area and protect the curb. So they used a bunch of dirt to protect the curb and never removed the dirt. And now it's going off site, right? Right. And so what they finally did in that roadside ditch is they put the wrong blanket, the bird netting blanket designed for slopes, and they didn't install it well. And so, and of course, it's undermining the silt fence, the concentrated flow. But it might look pretty from my house, but that is a down cut underneath that blanket, which is the wrong blanket for slopes only, not concentrated flow, has bird netting that catches snakes. And they're supposed to have a cross check trench or stapling pattern. So the main key for all blankets is water cannot get underneath it or you failed. And you can see that it is down cutting. You see the shadow, the yeah. down cutting is happening there because water is allowed to get underneath, which means it's a useless payment. They paid for uselessness. And they put the check dams just back like they were and they're just gonna blow out or be circumvented. Now, yeah, I won't go into that point, but anyway, you can see that it's not working. And endless failure, check dams only, stop doing it. There's my dog, there's the lake. Mm. Uh, and there's the Mississippi River Creek. Oh my goodness, there again. You can see the shadow of the failure under the silt fence, under the straw blanket. Okay, there you go. Love ah. it, love it. So I'll stop sharing and I wanna hear about your, how come you got to go to Yosemite? And I had to come to Minnesota. <laughs> uh, well, I don't, yeah. What, were you the QSP there? QSP? Some, somebody's got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, the uh, National Park Service um, hired us to help them with their restoration projects. Cool. And let me share. I got a few pictures. So you were um, the restoration. Not as interesting as David's. These meadows? These meadows? Yeah. Can I ask, can I ask a question? Definitely. <laughs> I was just um, on that last um, slide that David had been showing. Yeah. Uh, you pointed out what went wrong, but how would you improve it? What right. are some the, improvements on some of these? On the, on the swale that had the straw blanket, you mean? Yes. Yeah, so that, that swale should have had a uniform grading, a proper seed bed that would grow plants, and then a good seed application, and a coconut probably blanket with no plastic that is uh, well installed and Again, there have to be periodic cross checks of either a heavy stapling pattern going across that swale so water comes and tries to get under the blanket and that stapling pattern forces the water to stay on top of the blanket. So frequent cross slots, either an actual trench per manufacturer's instructions on the label or stapling to keep the water never getting underneath. So the cross check is critical. Also that slope had a runoff from the road, sheet flow from the road, was forming uh, concentration points down the slope to the swale and we had massive rilling occurring. So proper blankets would keep the water on top and, and not allow it to really concentrate in that way because blankets help against concentration too when they're installed properly. But I hope that helps answer. 
Thank you. Um, and then on the reservoir issue, the first one you were talking about, and would would vegetation have helped that? I mean, they sure. you said they had a small little hydro um, right. distributor yeah. truck, right. Right. but yeah. if they had hit it early on with heavier applications, would that have yes. solved yeah. most of the problems right. with vegetation? Yeah, so either you're going to have something heavy duty, like uh, a really good straw and glue, which they don't do there, they do crimping. So they're not going to do the right straw application there that's not in their system. So we want to see a good blanket on those slopes. So the hydro cedar, good news is you can see the huge area with that small hydro cedar, and that's good. Many seeds spit out, and then the expensive slow blanket goes over it that's highly effective and does it once, one installation, and those seeds start popping under a good blanket. It can be the straw blanket, but without the plastic netting. We don't need a blanket rated for a swale on those slopes. We need a cheaper blanket. And then when it's properly installed, those seeds sprout up very quickly and the blanket gets lost in the vegetation that emerges. And that's the so, so using like a jute um, webbing for the jute blanket? Jute is okay, you know, but I, you know, jute's okay. And the problem with when, when the installer uses jute, see the good news about jute is it can go over a very bumpy condition that we like. And that means less soil preparation, which we like because we like the bumpiness, that's the P factor. So jute will conform if you let it, but the installer never lets the jute that would conform. They stretch it. And when you stretch it, you open the jute and now you failed. All the water's going through the jute from ridge to shining ridge, the bumpy roughness that we love is serving to stretch the jute across. So we have to install it so it conforms if we use jute. And then we can even have a less prepared surface, which is good. So that would be a good recipe too. Less uniformity on the slope, more rugosity and roughness. Does that Thank help? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Good, good, okay. good comments. Well, David, uh, so yeah, Where's just this week I was in, um, Yosemite, and I think this is my fifth time there this summer or something like that. And um, I've been very blessed to be able to be a part of these restoration projects. And I have a small part. My part is the erosion sediment control portion of it. But I, we, we also work as a team with National Park Service. Uh, most of this work is actually done um, by them. They don't actually contract out the physical labor and the, and the uh, construction part of it, the National Park Service actually does it. What we're looking at here is the Merced River. Just if you're familiar with the location um, or with Yosemite, it's, uh, oh, not very far from Curry Village. Uh, it's, uh, I'm actually taking this picture from the Stoneman Bridge, and I'll show you some pictures probably of that here soon. But uh, this would get John McCullough excited, right, David? He, right. I mean, this is like his thing. I, I felt like John McCullough when I was on this. Uh, but, yeah, but basically what they're doing is they're, um, uh, I'm working with a team of what they call restoration ecologists, and they're trying to restore the park back to natural conditions. Over the decades, uh, a lot of well-meaning folks have done things like I was mentioning earlier about the meadows, uh, but also about rivers. They thought the thing to do with a river was to, to in order to prevent erosion, was to armor it with riprap. And uh, that's not always such a good idea because there's some really, um, they, it, it can cause some other consequences that are not so desirable. Uh, and what they were seeing at this location was a cutting of the banks. You know, we talk about this on day three of our QSP, QSD class, right? Uh, the cutting of the banks, you know, degradation was happening. And of course, where you get degradation in one area, you're going to get aggradation in another area. Uh, so the, the, with the cutting of the banks, water was moving faster. And also water during high water events was not going where it should go. It was going down. It was acting like a giant concrete line channel and taking it to, to the ocean rather than letting it get out into the meadows and do its thing. So uh, the, the park service, the, the ecologists have um, designed 
what you're looking at is very intentional. What they do is they they harvest trees and usually the trees that they're taking out are either for fire control or they're um, species of trees that were planted, again, by well-meaning people, but uh, in places that are not native for them, not, not uh, intended for them. And so they harvest these trees and then they actually design a, uh, uh, a system where the root masses, as you see in the photo, are sticking out and, um, and then the trees go into this bank. So they cover what you're seeing, they're, 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 they're whole trees, the majority of the tree obviously being underground. And let's see if I can get my annotating tools here. Uh, I'm not that great drawer, but at least you can see certain things. So the river is flowing this way. And of course, during construction, what we have is the, the turbidity curtain right here. And you can tell, I don't know, we're getting a lot of reflection, a beautiful reflection actually, but the water quality is very good actually inside and outside of the uh, turbidity curtain. But this, this is basically protecting the river. And of course, uh, we're doing this project under the construction general permit, but there's other environmental permits involved like the 401 water quality certification, 404 U.S. Army Corps uh, permit, and also uh, Section 1600 uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife permits that all talk about best management practices and things we have to have in place to make sure that the Merced River here is not being impacted. And so they lay down these trees right here. And so you see them here and here, and actually they make a cross network of it. And then they backfill all this is backfilled in here with, with sediment. Now, how this is uh, meant to work is as the, uh, especially during high water flows, as they, the, and we're in a drought season right now, um, and the river is very low right now. In fact, none of the waterfalls are flowing. Yosemite uh, Falls uh, this week was completely dry. Not that unusual, but especially this year with the drought. And so what happens is as the flow comes in, what it does is it creates these little eddies and it redirects the energy out to the center. So it comes in, redirects it, and the energy goes out here. Of course, this, this is where I start sounding like McCullough. And uh, that, that puts, puts the energy of the water out in the center where it belongs, but it slows it down here. And what you will start getting is this will start getting sedimentation occurring and we start building up this, this bank. And especially during high water events, uh, we get more and more deposition here. And so the, the goal is we're taking this cut bank and we're turning it into a nice gentle slope. Now to augment that, uh, the, the National Park Service, uh, the ecologists are also putting in live willow stakes and David knows a little bit about that. And, um, and also doing some native plant plugs and also using some harvested or uh, basically they have a farm uh, that uh, they were or greenhouses where they grow uh, natives that have been harvested from, from Yosemite. And uh, actually right now it's a little challenge to get that because that is located in the Sequoia National Park. And that's, being, that's surrounded with a wildfire right now. And so uh, one of the reasons why this project got put on hold is they can't actually get the plant material to, the, to, the, to Yosemite right now because of the fire. So- um, Hey John, uh, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, in so, fact, yeah, so go ahead. Did you observe like that at this location, the Thalweg or the low spot in the uh, channel uh, was aiming at that eroded bank in any way? And, and the idea would be, if you found that to be true, that, that by putting this roughness here, you know, like is referred to in Manning's equation, we now turn a scour point into a sedimentation zone. And that's what you're saying, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And did yeah. you notice the Thalweg or the low spot aiming yes. here and there? Yeah. Yeah, this is right where it was. Right. And so trying to not overcompensate and bounce the water too far to the other side too quickly to aim it to the middle downstream is, is quite a hard thing to do. But yeah. That's the goal. Yeah. And um, 
And speaking of which, I don't know, do I have a picture here? We'll see if I have one. But um, uh, one of the things I love to do, yeah, I do have a picture. It will be coming to it a little bit. I love to go up to Glacier Point and look at where the glaciers would run or in the last ice age ran through that area. And right now we're looking at the uh, Awani Meadow, but in the background, of course, is something iconic. It's Half Dome. And, uh, you know, in, in studying creek theory, um, the thalwag is usually on the outside of the bend, like you just said, right, David? And that's, that's the side of the river or the creek that gets the most pressure. That's where the scour point is at. Well, you want to guess on which side of the bend of the glacier Half Dome was on? It was on the Thalwag side. It was on the outside bend of the glacier. And glaciers are nothing but frozen rivers. They have the same characteristics as, as creeks and streams and rivers. And in fact, it was John Muir who did those, those observations. Uh, John Muir was the first one who um, uh, came to understand that Yosemite was formed through glacial action. At that time, the head of the US Geological Service was none other than Josiah Whitney, who Mount Whitney is named after. Uh, but what he believed was that the Yosemite Valley formed by an, a giant collapse, that the whole valley just collapsed. You know, 3,200 feet or 4,000 4, feet went down, boom. Uh, and uh, Mir comes and goes, no, no, no. You know, he's seeing, he's looking at all of these signs of, of uh, glaciers and he's looking at the, uh, the striations on the side of the, of the uh, granite faces. He's looking at the polishing. He's looking at the moraines. He's looking at the uh, erratics that have been deposited on top of, of things that, you know, huge giant boulders that shouldn't be there. He said, no, it's, it's glacial action. Um, and, uh, you know, Whitney wouldn't believe him. In fact, Whitney called him a, a, a ignoramus um, sheep herder because wow. uh, John Muir was uh, uh, his first. If you haven't read it, you have to read My First Summer in the Sierras by John Muir. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to think Muir was like a, oh, I don't know, like a David Thoreau, you know, kind of just a deep thinker. No, no. Mir was a man's man. He he did things that were insane. Uh, he was uh, he he did amazing uh, feats of of uh, uh, mountainry, uh, mountaineering and and different things. But he was also a great great scientist, ecologist. You have to read it. But uh, his first summer in the Sierras, he was a shepherd. He went with a shepherd just so he could basically have an excuse to be there. This is Iwani Meadow and. Uh, what we're, we've been working on since 2016, in fact, we're on our last phase here, is restoring the meadow to its function. And, you know, um, decades ago in the late 1800s, um, people looked at meadows and said, you know, they just breed mosquitoes. We can't park cars there. We can't camp in them. We can't put our tents in there. They're wet and boggy. And let's fill them in. And so that's what they did. And, uh, you know, in this spot right here, they pulled out, oh, they pulled out, they went down eight or 12 feet and pulled out, oh, I think uh, 500 tons of uh, fill that had been placed here. And the other places they had to fill in uh, ditches, man-made ditches made to drain the meadow. And they also had to uh, remove carriage roads and different roads. Um, and why are they going to all this effort? Well, it's so that the meadow will work as a meadow. And, uh, you know, probably mentioned it earlier, but 90% of San the Bay Area's water is filtered through Sierra Meadows. And meadows are, are actually one of the best water treatment systems there are. And uh, they receive the snow melt, they hold on to it, they're basically giant sponges. and uh, they they keep fairly wet. And um, even during a drought year, you can still see some green grass out there, even during a year where we only got eight inches of rain. I think uh, Minnesota got a little bit more, huh? Yeah. 
So here I'm at, at the uh, Stoneman Meadow. We're inspecting the vegetation. And again, this is just a few weeks ago. So you can see the meadow starting to work um, by creating the right conditions. We're getting, getting great biodiversity. By that, what I mean is different types of plants are coming in. I, uh, they were encouraged by plant plugs and reinducing uh, certain natives. But what's been got the ecologists really excited is by establishing the right conditions, they've gotten volunteers that they didn't expect. They've gotten plants that they didn't re, uh, reintroduce, but just reintroduce themselves because they restored the conditions back to what they should be. Um, and so, uh, really great to see. So uh, uh, earlier this month, well, it's October 1st, so middle of September, uh, I had been working out all summer, David, trying to, to get ready for this trip, but we hiked the four mile trail, which is a misnomer. It's actually 4.7 miles. And I tell you that that 0.7 miles is, is um, a big deal. Uh, but it's, uh, we go from the valley floor up to Glacier Point and it's a 3,200 foot elevation change. And uh, now I'm looking at the Stoneman Meadow, which we just had right here. And so this is a couple of weeks ago and you can still see some green in a very, very extreme drought year. Uh, straight yeah, but down. John, I'm not gonna give you your NOT until the Russell factor says that, uh, that you're uh, <laughs> against background. Like That's that. good. It, uh, we haven't applied for an NOT yet, but we're getting close. <laughs> and this is the Awani Meadow here. In fact, that's right here, the last phase right in this area right here. Uh, but you can see the previous phases and look at this willow grove right here. You see that? We are so excited about that. That was a volunteer. So excited about that. And uh, we're seeing habitat come back. And uh, here's a, a relatively healthy meadow. See, it's still green even during a, a, a drought year. Oh, and here's where Yosemite Falls should be. See the stain right here? Wow. Drought no water. Hey, Question for you now, uh, those meadows, is their main source of water that the snow melt each spring that just infiltrates in? Snow melt, springs, um, uh, shallow groundwater flow through the canyon. Uh, but yeah, yeah, snow melt it would be the primary one. Oh, oh, and then the other one is during high water events during flooding. And that's why the, the, the river restoration is going hand in hand with the meadow restoration yeah. is that the river should overflow and go into the meadows. We want them to do that. Right, as a little and, flood uh, condition. Now we have a question there too, John. Will trees eventually march into the meadow? Great question. Excellent question. No, no, trees, trees don't grow in meadows. It's not the right environment. In fact, um, you'll have to watch our it's, uh, uh, shameless plug here our restoration series on our forge, on our forge training website, um, uh, where we did a whole series on restoration in Yosemite or along the Merced River. And there's this controversy uh, that the Park Service has gotten involved in called um, historic uh, scenery restoration. In other words, they're cutting down trees so everybody can see the scenery they've seen for decades, like Yosemite Falls, you know, for example, it, you want to be sitting in the Awani Hotel in the dining room, seeing the beautiful waterfalls, but so many trees grew up that they couldn't see it. Right. So what's the Park Service doing cutting down trees just so the, the, the diners can see their favorite waterfall? Well, wow. actually, those trees are, were um, invasive species. They planted sequoias there. And who would cut wow. down a sequoia? Well, they planted sequoias where sequoias have never historically grown. Okay. And so uh, when a meadow is working properly, uh, it has a different geology, has a different soil type. Uh, right. It has a different ha uh, ecosystem and trees do not naturally grow there. They'll grow on the fringes, but not in the meadow. Good and John, question. is that because the, uh, the moisture content <clears throat> is too high there on the average? In the Correct. Like Correct. Yeah. And so when you dry it out, now trees will grow. Willows right. are a little bit different. I don't know. In the Sierras, I don't necessarily call willows trees. I know mm -hmm. in our in the neighborhood, you might consider a willow a tree. They're a different type of willow. 
so they're until, more they're more a blush. So until until actual forces change those conditions, uh, trees are kept out naturally. Yeah, yeah. And so because man changed the way meadows were working, basically stopped having them work the way they worked, uh, trees started moving in. Right. So yeah, anyways, it, too much to talk about even today, but uh, watch that series. I think you'll find it interesting, uh, really interesting. So, you know, um, we've done a series in the Grand Canyon. You, you, you know, you might find David in Minnesota, but you're going to find me in a national park whenever I get a chance to. Uh, so in 2018, we did the Grand Canyon Erosion Theory series. And if you haven't seen that, I think you'd enjoy it. Hey, hey John, did you have any good music for that uh, series? Yes, we did. Yeah, David, his, his, uh, we used his original scores. That's and, shameless, isn't it? That's shameless. Uh, no, it, 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 it was perfect. His music is absolutely perfect. And, and how much better that erosion uh, control buddy did it. So anyways, uh, yeah. it, you got to watch it. You haven't seen it. You got to watch it. And just if nothing else, to enjoy the music. Nice. And David and I want to team up. We're, we're trying to make this happen. This is also to go David into it a little bit more. Uh, but uh, 2022, I'm turning my eyes to a different national park. You know, not that I'm going to stop going to Yosemite and Yellowstone and Grand Canyon, but Death Valley. You know, I went to Death Valley right before the pandemic broke out, February 2020. <laughs> what a time to go to the Death Valley. Uh, but uh, uh, I was so impressed. You know, I was like, you know, the, my wife and, and the friends that we went with were always telling me, get back in the car, will you? Mm. You know, I was running around going, look at this sedimentation. This is amazing. <laughs> and so Dave and I are, and hopefully if, if our buddy John gets healthy, keep him in your prayers. Um, we want to go, we want to get an off-road Jeep. And we want to go to Death Valley and do a video series called Extreme Erosion. And cool. it's amazing. I mean, there's this place in Death Valley that's a dry lake bed. And you find these boulders, big rocks. And behind them is a trail that's maybe half a mile long. It's like, how did they get there? How did they move? Are aliens moving them? <clears throat> you know? What's going on here? Wow. Well, actually, they're great erosion, great erosion uh, examples. Are you excited, David? Fun. I'm excited. That sounds fun. And uh, oh. uh, make sure it happens. I'll be there. Wait till you see a sedimentation field almost as big as the one you showed us in Minnesota. Uh -huh. <laughs> actually, it's all, all, all natural BMPs out there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, you, you see all the vegetation they have here. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, that, I think that was the only vegetation I found. Well, <laughs> but but you see these sediment deposition fields that are like three miles long, and you can see them. <laughs> so, anyways, um, well, now excited. the thing is, um, we had a few questions about the willows, and what about willows? And uh, any other questions that people want to pop uh, verbally or via chat? I think we should give some time for that because yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, we've been doing a lot of talking. Yeah, what do you, Look, what, just one more slide here, just shameless okay. plug. Hey, I, when I'm when when I'm not uh, when David's not talking about erosion, he's he's playing a banjo. When I'm not talking about uh, erosion, I I have this uh, website I've created that talks about Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, and Yosemite in a unique way. FaithandScienceIntersect.org. Check it out. Nice. I'll stop nice. the share here. Cool. Um, um, comment on the willows. Uh, question was, what about willows? Oh, so that you did answer. You said uh, they might uh, populate if they had a way to get in and you don't really view them as trees and uh, unless they're native there. Well, somebody was asking about how to find the uh, restoration series. You just go to um, uh, wgr-sw.com and hit the training button and you'll see it there. wgr-sw.com, hit the training yeah. button. And other questions anybody might have or comments. Uh, a lot of folks have experience too and can add to the insight. This has been so fun, David. I have to yeah. come back and join you for a, a open forum Friday. 
I know we got another workshop that's starting here. So well, what time is it starting at? 9.30, so we still got a little bit of time. But uh, we don't want to rush off. Let's take some questions, comments. Let's let's open it up. It's open forum Friday, right? Yeah. yeah. We'll, uh, we'll be hanging out and taking questions and comments and additions, uh, but our hour's up, but we're still here, uh, ready to talk anything erosion, stormwater. Anybody want to be brave? Let me, let me check the chat. I haven't checked it. Yeah. Somebody did get, provide the link. Which oh, was thank you. Yeah. I was just curious about um, your meta restoration and trees not coming back. So you're saying that non-invasive, um, if, if kept to a native species, that your meadows will remain shrubs and um, herbs uh, uh, in the trees. No native trees from uh, Yosemite would come back and obscu uh, take over the Correct. meadows. I'm in Northern California and that's one of the big things is that our meadows get infiltrated by native trees and there's a big uh, controversy of, well, do we cut back the native spruce that are taking over some of the meadows? Um, and so I'm curious how, it sounds like you don't have that issue no. in well, Yosemite. Well, well, actually it's a great question, a great comment. So just because it's a native tree doesn't mean it's native to a meadow. So if a native, even a native California tree is showing up in a meadow, there's probably a problem with the meadow. That's yeah. what we've learned at Yosemite. So John, uh, adding to that, your comment there and Cindy, the spruce in Northern California, my understanding is, is, is pretty amazing what I've heard. And, and here's how it works. And see if you confer, concur with what I'm gonna say. Much of Northern California is being ruined by pot farmers that are destroying the groundwater levels. And as a result, when the groundwater levels in the creeks and streams is dropped, the adjacent locations become drier, areas that formerly kept out those trees. But now, because they become drier because of a reduction of groundwater, those spruce are marching into those meadows that are now histor drier than historically. Does that make sense to what you've seen? Um, I, I can thoroughly agree with the pot growing issue, but um, some of these uh, uh, meadows are in park service areas and don't uh -huh. have as much of the influence of pot growing. Okay. And, the, uh, we, yeah. have, we have an area, up, I'm in Arcata, yeah. um, and I think there's a Crescent City person I think I heard when I popped in, yeah, who's right. in the area. And we have um, a Redwood National Park, which is um, Bald Hills, and, 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 and because we don't have the influence of Native American um, ground burning. Um, uh, we have historic uh, meadows that are being encroached in by Doug fir and the yeah. Sitka spruce. But and this is prior, you know, and prior to cannabis growing. And it's yeah. it's it seems like the meadows are shrinking. And you know, doing soil okay. studies, they notice that yeah. um, it's historically you, that the the meadows have been burned in the prior yeah. okay. to keep them established. Okay, so you're not making a correlation between uh, reduction of groundwater levels for from any cause uh, at all, anyway. So that's good to know. Yeah. In certain, in certain, in this particular instance, I'm I'm thinking of, and, and there's the controversy. Well, do we, you know, are should we be taking out these native trees and and, and let na nature do its course, or do we retain right. the? Yeah. And so I was wondering if you had the same issue in Yosemite, where you're. you're being making judgment calls of can we get rid of some of these trees to keep the meadow and it, it's not so much a it, it's it's when we return the meadow back to its uh, intended purpose or to its correct ecological state then they are not a place where trees can grow uh, uh in a healthy meadow if you go up into the Sierras that has not been man touched, you know, not, not, not really impacted by development or, or changes like in the valley floor of Yosemite, there's so much history there. Uh, but if you go in a place where it hasn't been touched, the trees naturally stay on the fringe of the meadow because the ecosystem of the meadow won't allow it to grow. Not that that seeds don't drop on it and cones don't drop on it and 
and try to propagate, it just can't survive in that ecosystem. And so if it is surviving, that tells me that something's happened to that ecosystem. Now it could be man-caused or it could be natural. You know, things do change over time. It could be that uh, uh, whatever was feeding the groundwater is no longer feeding it. Maybe there's not as much snow melt historically, maybe climate change is changing how that meadow is functioning. Thank you, and I, I appreciate that comment. Any, anybody else? About anything, maybe about David Spanjo playing. You got any new songs, David? Yeah, you can YouTube me, a couple out there. <laughs> the Trappy Swinger, that's a good one. I, you sent me that, that was a good one. Yeah, I like it. All right, well, just a few more moments. If you, if you, if now's the time to pick David's brain. If you pick mine, you won't get much. But he's he's got a he's got a gold mine there. Um, just Is there ever a a good upper, a good way that the plastic jute work or excuse me, the plastic um, um, the straw know. netting with the plastic in there. Yeah. Is there ever appropriate? Because is it always, I mean, because I know there's issues with snakes. So yeah, I know. getting caught in them. Is there well, ever a use for that that doesn't our, have those kind of issues? Know, our attitude should be, we're just not going to do it. Maybe if you're in downtown Los Angeles and there's a little slope where there's no wildlife, whatever like that. But, you know, you got the coconut with the natural yarn netting that is a little more expensive. It's beautiful stuff. Just let's go there and stop with the plastic already. Yeah, especially since we have so much trash problems. The yeah. thing isn't that it's the wrong application. The thing is that people tend to leave them out too long. Oh, I wish I would have taken a picture this week when I was leaving Yosemite. It was actually outside of the park. I've seen a oh. project that I've passed for maybe 10 years. And yeah. Now the uh, that that fiber roll looks like like uh, it was hung for Christmas time. It looks like right. you know boughs, you know, <laughs> sweeping, and it'll probably be there for another ten years until it finally disintegrates into little plastic nurdles that makes it into right. the creek and then out to right. the ocean. All right. Wow. Hey John. Um, so so that's the message there. Uh, let's not use plastic. But we have a great question here too on the. Uh, a draft permit uh, coming out uh, maybe in a year and a half. Uh, Russell 2 modeling for all high risk receiving waters uh, for every slope and every temporary BMP. It's insane. What do you think about that? I, Mel, you asked that question to Amy too. And of course on that one, I couldn't um, really comment, but I will comment a little more freely today. And I agree with your, your comment in saying I have, Maybe David feels differently, but I have never been a Russell 2 fan. Uh, I've, I've used it. I've tried using it. And to me, you know, it, to me, it's just too crude of an instrument or a blunt of an instrument. It, it's not refined enough. Um, I think it can give you a false sense of security. Uh, I can see why, why agencies want to hang on to it because it's, just the same way they use the water balance calculator uh, for post-construction. It's a convenient way to quantify things, but it's just, just stick to regular Russell if you're going to do anything. Um, I'm not a fan. Yeah. So I, I kind of share your sentiments. It says for every slope, every change during construction, every BMP on every single one of my projects here in North Carolina. Yeah, you know, I didn't, to be honest, when I look at the permits that come out every few years, <clears throat> they're so painful for me to look at because of the poor technical editing that is thrown into our lap to process and the endless comments like this one that we have to struggle to process and give back to them. I just don't like to even have to take on that challenge, but not having looked at much of that part of the draft permit, that this question is about. One thing I'd like to point out about Russell, whether it's you know, Russell one or two, is it's a very subjective approach to assessment and it gets more objective if we have a two scenarios 
that are compared because the data input of the user is a subjective process. And so we want the same person to be punching in the data. And then the comparison starts to get more objective when you have two junk inputs from the same person comparing two scenarios. And then what does it mean? You know, I'm not too much of a fan of it, except, you know, sort of empirically, that's what it is. It's an empirical uh, assessment. Right. And um, there are some things I like in the new permit that are coming out. I, I like what they did with now the storm event uh, definition. I do like that. Um, they're headed the right direction with the monitoring. We gave them some good comments. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, they uh, the water board incorporates some of the stuff that comes from experienced QSPs and QSDs. Um, yeah, the, the comment here is a uh, person agrees about, but having to struggle with uh, adding BMPs on top of one another. Uh, like blanket and then seed and whatever else in order to get the numbers uh, high enough or low enough so that the uh, total tons is better than prior. But, yeah. Um, um, the, I'm, I, I really am kind of dismayed at the prescriptiveness of some of the BMPs that are coming out right. in this permit. Right. Well, uh, yes. To me, it's not realistic. It's, yeah. it, you know, the, a big comment I made in my comment letter back to the water board was, look, you spent all this time and energy in training QSBs and QSDs and raising up a certification that was meaningful. Now put faith in that professional, right? Take the handcuffs off us and let us do our jobs the way we know to do it. If you're going to do anything, hold greater accountability, maybe to QSPs, you QSDs. Think, you think. And so, uh, it's one thing to say you must cover your dumpsters. It's another to say put linear barriers at the grade break toe and face because the toe and the face and the, the toe and the grade break aren't correct. Mm -hmm. So they should not be so prescriptive. But on this uh, thing with the uh, Russell, I'd like to also mention that because it's a user-based assessment, our best professional judgment gets to come in and tweak our data input maybe even adjusting what the Russell 2 values give and have reason and cause. So I'm not opposed to winning through professional judgment that tweaks the model. Yeah, yeah. So focus on winning with your professional judgment that overrides the handcuffs of the model. Yeah, whether it's Russell 2 or whether it's trash bins or whether it's any of the BMPs, you know, uh, I made a comment about concrete washout. You know, for years, people were saying, what's wrong with washing a chute down right in front of what I'm about to pour on? Mm -hmm. And as a scientist, as a chemist, there's no difference. You know, I, I have this picture, David, that I show in my training. It's, it's a guy washing down his chute into a, re, a recycle but bucket and water's going everywhere. You know, clearly a violation if the water board was coming to it. But right next to it is this gigantic pour. It's got to be, you know, hundreds of yards of concrete. Right. Okay. It's like, what, what does that little spray, I mean, I know, you know right. the heartburn about that, but what's that little spray compared to the hundreds of yards of concrete we just poured right there? Right. Well, you know, John, back in the olden times, we used to get to wash our concrete chute into the formed area where the next truck was going to pour. Okay, so that was what we used to do. But the thing is that one reason that's legitimate that these uh, BMPs uh, become prescriptive is because, you know, in 92, when SWIPs became required for uh, construction sites uh, under the general permit, uh, everybody promised to be good through this SWIP. And then, then everybody throws that promise out and goes to make uh, their job get done instead of protecting the environment. So prescriptive BMPs have a place. And when we used to be able to wash our concrete chute into the form that was going to be filled next, the reason it's maybe not okay to have that policy anymore is because the operator fails to manage that action. And now that slurry water basically goes under the form and to the creek and nobody notices or gives a damn because they, yeah. they get to. So we have to stop letting everybody get to do certain things because they don't manage it well. They failed to hold their promise 
to be good. And so yeah. there's an argument for that. So but, yeah. So ahead. I advocate, like I just said, is drop the prescriptiveness, but ratchet up the accountability. Exactly. We have to do in that. In other words, business. your professionals should make the call and they should be accountable. Yeah, we don't have enough accountability. And I've been pointing that out in the recent CASCA conference calls. But the other comment here is uh, Waterboard has been firing back about professional judgment assumptions and saying that they disagree. Well, you know, um, uh, and I want to ask about this too, John, uh, but on the topic of the Waterboard shooting back, um, you know, we have decades of regulators telling us to do the wrong BMP because they don't understand. So I want to see the regulators be doing a lot more of the BMP training so they can get on the same page and we'll have less of this shooting back because they don't understand uh, what you know the principles are. Now it also says, okay, um, yeah, we'll talk about that if there's a ch chance, but <laughs> it also says we have been washing out into forms and instead it adds too much water or something and the concrete never sets. And that's another reason, of course. So you're you're uh, ruining your pour that comes, that follows next. So it's just many reasons why not to be allowed. But that's that's his contractor's call. That shouldn't be, shouldn't be uh, regulated. Yeah, well, I hear you, but I kind of lean a little bit away from what your angle is. I like a self- management like you're pointing out but i know that it's providing an excuse for the operator to say nobody can make us do it correctly or yeah do it and i understand i understand the need for prescriptiveness i i just like to see it uh shift a little more towards trust your professional yeah i like that too but you and i've seen so many people who call themselves professionals who <laughs> is like you wrote you know <laughs> you know you've seen this whips um, yeah, I'll put my contact information there. Hey, no, John, I want to ask you while I'm typing in my contact information. I want to ask you about this topic. All right, so that should be my. Um, John, you know, years ago when the water board came out with the red zone for high receding water risk, right? The red zone, Google Earth. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when that came out, uh, we were informed, and I even asked Laurel Wardrip in the trainer of record phone conference, point blank. I said, Laurel, must everybody use the red zone, yes or no? And she said, yes, unless you get a waiver from the regional board. Now, is that been your thinking all along or not? Nor has it been my experience. So um, uh, in the way we teach our our, our uh, QSP, QSD classes is that you can override it and SMARTS gives you the ability to override it. And I've found two places in the state you probably should question the red zone is um, <clears throat> Oakland, the greater Oakland area, and, and also San Jose. Because well, exactly, that's what I've done too. Because you have lots of receiving waters going through there. Some have cold spawn and migratory. Right. Some only have two, some have none. Right. And so especially San Jose, you should find your project, find which drain inlet it goes into in the municipality. So get a, a city of San Jose a storm drain map. Yeah. Find out where that, that water will daylight, which creek it will go into. Then go to the, the Bay Area Basin Plan, um, Section 2. Right. Look up the, um, the, the beneficial uses mm -hmm. for that water body. Get a screen printed because if it's uh, only two one or zero, then you got proof that it is a low. Yeah. And you can override it. Right. So here's my input, unless you want to say something else. Somewhere. Well, what I was going to say is I also had dialogue with the water board years ago that basically said, I knew there were areas like Elk Grove, for example, yeah. that was definitely cold spawn and migratory. Absolutely. And, but, um, the 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 red zone was not there it was clear right and i asked smarts about that i asked i think patrick osuji is someone i asked about i'm trying to remember maybe it was laurel it was years ago yeah and uh they said well if smart says it's a low it's a low and you can just right. take that and we used to teach oh you can have your cake and eat it too right. until this year i had a regional board then say, nope, sorry, even though SMART says it's clear, sorry, That's we're right. considering it high, you, you know, gotta go Oakland, high. Right? 
in Oakland. Right? No, no, this was actually in the Tulare area. Okay. So John, um, the right. So Jerry and I have contacted the regional board a few times to show those errors and they've gone and fixed them. Okay. So they have been fixed. And uh, so there have been uh, changes, but also, so it's, it comes down to the permit is weaker than the red zone. And the red zone was given to us after the permit. And when it came out, I was hearing, being told that we're supposed to use the red zone only. Now, um, now when I spoke to Brandon recently, he didn't wanna play that angle. He wanted to say professional judgment can uh, find its course to you know, a level one or level two and not always follow the red zone. But if you go into smarts, John, when you are filling out those questions about uh, receiving water, blah, 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 the way I read the process in smarts, you are ordered to look at the PDF that describes the red zone. And the PDF states unequivocally that if you're in the red zone, which is a high risk watershed and not related to the actual water body you discharge to, you can be discharging to an unimpaired water body draining to the Bay Area, to the San Francisco Bay. And next door, there's a impaired water body and both are in the same Huck 10, which is the base basis for the red watershed. But that PDF, it appears to me, if you read the SMARTS guidance, is what you're supposed to use and you have no choice if you end up in the red zone, but to be a high receiving watershed risk. And Laurel said that same to me also. However, Brandon's view is that they only created this red zone map for those folks who are not able to clearly determine the lengthy process you just described of going here and going there and going here. And therefore they made this red zone as a less, uh, as a more punitive conservative approach than the permit. And that logic does follow the logic of the K and LS factors for Russell in which you are given conservative values from the state, but you get to override them with site specific knowledge if you can provide that knowledge. So there's a logic that way too. Yeah, and you know what? It, it, these days, it doesn't really matter what the state water board says. Because nobody's doing anything to protect no, the water bodies. It it's, it, the regional boards are coming up with their own interpretations. And the regional boards are, they'll come back, they're watching the NOIs, they'll come back to you and say, yeah. no, nope, we think this should be high. Right. Uh, and that's uh, so. another problem in itself is the ever conflicted guidance within the permit and with the SMARTS releases and on all these topics like when you can be an inactive site and be relieved from weekly inspections or REAPs or sampling or uh, the QSP mm -hmm. determines the frequency of inspections, not the QSD and all this conflicted stuff, which causes headaches for municipalities that get this conflicted guidance and the contractors and throw it in their face, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't envy their job. You know, for the most part, they do a really good job. I agree. Um, definitely true. They, they have a tough, tough line to pull, you yeah. know, that it's real. I, I wouldn't want to be it. <laughs> no, I agree. Totally true. Yes. And, and you know what? We we have great um, water board leadership. Um, we do. A Amy's amazing. I, I've so appreciated working with her and Brandon. They're yeah. very transparent. They, yes. they're, they, they, it, you, you don't get any personal agenda. Right. You, they, they seem more than willing to work with you. Now they might not agree with you, right? but they're very transparent. And I appreciate that. I can I work with too. anyone that's like that. Can't be complaining about yeah. that, you know. It, it just comes down to communication and interpretation, and mm -hmm. you live with it, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, David, any other comments or questions? No. This no. has been a lot of fun, but yeah. I think I'm going to have to sign off here pretty soon. We're almost right. nine thirty, so yeah. uh, I'm on for lunchtime. Great, yeah. they got your email right there, and uh, oh, let me just type in mine so people can get a hold of me if they want. Uh, but you're the expert. They should call you. Let's see. So it's Jay Taraskas at WGR-SW.com. There it is. Well, and John, um, Thanks again for inviting me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, yeah. do this. Uh, with it's been you. a lot of fun. And uh, we'll talk to you sometime soon. Okay. In, in Death Valley, right? We're doing Death Valley. Well, February, I'm, March 2022. I'm going to be there. All right. Good. Good. Okay. All right. Thanks, Take David. Care. Take care. All right. I'm hanging out because in our breakout room, we have uh, a meeting going on.
for a quick. So I'm all right, open up, but we'll see you later. Thanks.